Good afternoon and welcome to the January edition of RCC Talk. We're so glad that you joined us today. We have survived a mini blizzard um, and we're back in session full swing with classes today at RCC and we're glad that all our students were able to come back and our faculty and staff safely, safely to a clear, clean campus. Um, it's currently time for those who are considering continuing ed their education mm -hmm. to begin the application process for summer session and fall semester. It's not too early. If you have not completed your FAFSA for financial aid, it's time to get that going. Be sure and contact someone in our financial aid office and they will help you through the process. Turning to our students and their activities, we have recently hired a new director of student life, Maggie Murray. She's hit the ground running with some laser tag activities for students this week. Baseball season is fast approaching and two of my guests today happen to be advisors for student organizations and they're going to begin meetings the first of the semester to make plans. So there's never a dull moment even after a mini blizzard <laughs> here at the college. But welcome to my guest today Thank you. Um, and my co-host Sally Newman. I'm always happy you're here with me. Thank you. Mandy Combs is our Associate Professor of Biology. Tim Parrish is Department Chair for English and Language Studies. Lori Murphy is our Department Chair for Math and Learning Support Services. And Mark Sattler is Assistant Professor for History. So welcome today. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get started a little bit. Just um, tell me a little bit about your pathway to RCC, um, how you got here, your educational path, your career path. Um, what I see that you all have in common is you're sort of the second generation of RCC faculty. By that I mean when the college opened in the late 60s, you know, we attracted a group of faculty. They remained here until retirement. And so in the early 2000s, we started that shift after that group, and now we have completely switched our whole faculty department, mm -hmm. as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you come to RCC? I'll start. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, I was originally a journalist when I, I got my first college degree. I was a journalist, did that for about seven or eight years, and then I did what a lot of our students do, and I decided I want a second career. Mm -hmm. I didn't like what I was doing, and so I went back to a community college. Uh, and I just fell in love with history and with teaching. I had a brilliant uh, history teacher that kind of helped guide me and shape me and give me that example that we all really need of what we truly want to be. Uh, and from that, I went back, got my master's at the uh, University of Connecticut. And then I taught adjunct. I taught part-time here for a while. I was a truck driver. Uh, I was driving, uh, delivering Budweiser. Uh, and and uh, can you picture a little me throwing a lot of beer. Uh, every time I sit in a faculty meeting and people complain about how hard their jobs are, I just, mm -hmm. my eyes roll into the back of my head because uh, I've worked in 120 degree temperatures mm -hmm. and thrown, and it's a very different type of life. Uh, and I decided that I would much rather do this. Uh, and so when the opportunity came to come full time uh, in 2010, I believe, I, I jumped at the opportunity. Well, we're glad you did. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Who else can tell me? Go ahead, Mandy. Um, so in high school, I took a community college class my senior year, mm -hmm. and they kind of introduced me to the community college setting, so I really knew a little bit about it. But I got a um, bachelor's degree from biology from King University in Bristol, Tennessee, and then I was out with a biology degree. And there's really not a whole lot to do with a biology degree without specializing, without going on to graduate school. So I then went to um, working retail for a year and a half until I got accepted to graduate school. And I went to University of Toledo in Ohio, where I majored in ecology. And when I was graduating there, um, my husband and I were both looking for jobs, and I applied to RCC, and I was hired in 2003 um, as the biology lab technician. So I did all the ordering, all the setup, all the organizing, cleaned out closets that hadn't been touched for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> uh, and updated the system, updated labs, and I taught adjunct while I was here. And um, in 2006, uh, Ken Capps retired, and I took his position as a full-time professor. And so I've 
been here for almost 15 years this August. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tim? Let's see. <clears throat> I uh, graduated as an undergraduate in 1982, and if you look at any survey or records, that was probably the worst year to graduate anywhere. <laughs> um, so I spent 1982 and 1983 not gainfully employed, or at least not fully employed, and I realized that graduate school was sort of the uh, unemployment insurance for, for people with bachelor's degrees. Um, I actually went to graduate school for the job. They hired me to teach freshman English, um, and part of the stipend was they paid my tuition, and that's really why I, I got a graduate degree, was the job, and it was the best job I've ever had. Mm. I taught two sections of freshman English. I was making $500 a month, um, <laughs> but it, it was a job that gave me a lot of confidence and, and uh, yeah, a lot of status. I was really proud to have that job. When I finished my degree, I worked in advertising for three years. Uh, that was a lot of fun until the day it wasn't. <laughs> and I left that and moved into education. I, I taught at GTC, GTCC for a while, and then I actually worked for a long time for a company that I, I was technically an educational consultant. Uh, we, we developed individualized programs for kids who were struggling in school, and I was, I guess, a glorified tutor. But it was a lot more than that. And I worked there for, I think, about 12 years. And it, by the end of that, my time there, I was more management than anything else. But one semester, I had some time in the middle of my day that was open, and my wife saw an ad in the newspaper. This is when people read newspapers. Uh, for a part-time English instructor at RCC. I'm not even sure I have ever heard of RCC. <laughs> um, but uh, Joyce Russell hired me on Friday. I started on Monday. Wow. And the next year, uh, a full-time position came open, and I was lucky enough to get it. Mm -hmm. well, and that was the same 2003. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I actually had a TA um, in graduate school. I taught biology labs, and mm -hmm. that's when I realized that I loved college teaching because mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. different than anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lori. <laughs> well, I guess I'm a little different because I've <clears throat> always known I wanted to teach. Um, so I went, got my undergraduate degree, and taught high school, and tried that for three years, and said. Oh, no, I, I don't want to teach. <laughs> so I got out of teaching completely for eight years and kind of wandered around in different jobs trying to figure out what else I could do. Mm -hmm. um, and when 9-11 happened, I went back into teaching because at that point I had a two-year-old little boy and I wanted to be able to have some summer time with him. Um, but still, really, I tried private school, I tried middle school, I tried high school, I tried public school. And it wasn't until a friend of mine who was already teaching here, Sandy Key, said, you need to come out to RCC. And... I don't know that I'd ever heard of it because I'm not a Reesville native. I'm from Greensboro. But, um, so I came out here and, like you guys, was hired as an adjunct to start with. Went back to school at that point to get my master's. And that was the hardest thing I think mm. I've ever done after being out for 16 years. Mm. But I did it. <laughs> and I um, have been here ever since. That was in 2006. <coughs> as soon as I finished my master's, I was hired full time and absolutely love it. So I think I finally found the place where... I could teach, and then I loved it. So. Yeah, I, I taught elementary school for a year. It didn't take me long to figure yeah. out that wasn't the right setting. Well, it sounds like in education, sometimes there's a path that leads you to this to this level of teaching, and you all had a variety of career paths to begin with, um, and you all came as, as adjunct or uh, part-time. You were the lab coordinator, so that's... That's interesting that you came in that capacity and wanted to stay and, mm -hmm. and gain that full-time status, mm -hmm. and and now you've been here for 10-plus years, mm -hmm. so we're glad you're here. Yes. I know that that makes a good impact on our students to have um, consistency mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, now, in your disciplines, if our student, if a student is seeking a degree or diploma, mm -hmm. no matter what their field, they're going to cross paths with some of you, mm -hmm. no matter what mm -hmm. they do. Um, most likely math, mm -hmm. and English. most likely English. Um, and so, <coughs> talk to me as a group um, about your students, um, your young students um, in the classroom, and then we'll get to different types of students as we go on, but um, how do you help them 
fit into the pace of college? What, mm -hmm. what do you see that um, that young student who's fresh out of high school, or maybe, has, maybe they've been out of high school for a couple of years mm -hmm. and they're just entering the college environment? For me, it's, it's learning how to break skills down into their component parts and really being very clear in what you're expecting from a student, mm -hmm. clear rubrics, clear instructions and expectations, mm -hmm. and then just tons of feedback. Mm -hmm. Start with really low uh, cost or, or low impact nice assignments. Days. Yeah, so, so it's not, you know, you're not getting 100% of the class grade up front, you're ramping your, your way up to that and those mm -hmm. skills. And the more feedback you can give to those students, especially these young, we're getting a lot of uh, kids coming through the early college high school program, 16 year olds, 15 year olds, coming into a college classroom. I know if I were stepping into a classroom at that age, I'd be intimidated and my skill set would need help. Uh, so really early on, giving them good examples of what you're looking for. Uh, uh, showing them that behavior, going through those steps in the classroom mm -hmm. instead of outside in homework, mm -hmm. uh, and giving them those opportunities to get the immediate feedback, I think helps uh, just a, a ton right at that beginning. Well, and, and RCC is a teaching environment, mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like to me that you are taking time to pave the way for success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, were talk you were talking just with Mark about starting out with small assignments mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. aren't worth 50% of the grade. Right. Tell me a little bit about how you work that into your... So I try to hit, I feel like the younger generation, um, they don't respond as well to 50 minutes of lecture. Mm -hmm. You kind of see them, Going their through. eyes glaze over after about five <laughs> yeah. minutes. So I've tried to hit them with a lot of different ways to deliver mm -hmm. the instruction. I assign readings, even in math. Oh, mm -hmm. go Tim, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I give some lecture, but I try mm -hmm. to keep it at a minimum. And then we do activities in class where they get more, le more or less a participation grade rather mm -hmm. than right or wrong. Just, mm -hmm. and, and they are able to work in groups during those activities. Then they have homework assignments where they can go practice on their own, which are worth a little bit more and counted more right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Then I give lots of quizzes before the actual test. So we try to really hit them in, at different ways that they can absorb the information and actually learn it and not mm -hmm. just for the moment, just right. to pass that test. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that you handle your classrooms different. You lecture, you have experiments. Mm -hmm. You conduct projects, maybe group work assignments, mm -hmm. but in your experience, um, what situations in your classroom really seem to spark the interest of most of your students? And just just jump in. I think it's application because mm -hmm. you know I can sit there and tell them, well, this is a structure of a cell and this is what this does, and that gets really boring. Mm -hmm. So I try to incorporate humor, but also try to incorporate. Mm -hmm things they'll see, like um, there's advertisements for find your ancestry. Well, I tell them where that comes from, why it's important, mm -hmm. and how it relates to everything. And if you can do that, they're more apt to remember those things because it's connecting to something in their daily life. Mm -hmm. And I try as much as possible to connect my concepts to other classes I may have taken. Anthropology, talk, I mentioned history today, I talked some about physics because education isn't just learning this block, this block, and this block, it's how it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And so I really try hard to bring that all together because that's life. Life is interconnected, it's not mm -hmm. A, B, C, and D. It's mm -hmm. all of it. Yeah, I would completely concur. If we can take an issue, say, from the end of slavery and Reconstruction, mm -hmm. uh, the issues that happened there, and make those connections to today, how is that still affecting your life today? What issues are there still that we're seeing around race in America? And we clearly see that today. Mm -hmm. when, we can, when I can throw out a question like that, having prepared them with relevant material that they can bring, and, and, and it's not just dry, drop a subject, but working them towards that, mm -hmm. and then stepping back and allowing students to conduct that conversation themselves mm -hmm. with respect, that is, for me, some of the most 
the richest experience you can have in a classroom. It's when students are really doing the work of teaching each other. Mm -hmm. You step back and you're not really doing the job, you're just moderating. They're the, really the ones doing the work and carving those pathways. That's magic. Mm -hmm. That is just magic. Sounds like a, a very different college classroom than those of the early 80s. Mm -hmm. yes. A lot has changed. <coughs> um, and I, th I think that has to do with who our students are and mm -hmm. what they respond to and uh, what we need to deliver. Mm -hmm. What other types of special projects or activities seem to engage students more, most? Well, my English 112 class, and that's a, the second of two entry kind of freshman level courses. And it's supposed to be, a, it is a class in which students are supposed to begin thinking, writing, reading within the discipline that they will pursue after the, in their third and fourth years of college. And the major project of that class, and which consumes really the last quarter of their class, is uh, I give them an assignment where, first of all, they have to design the assignment. Um, I give them a template of how to create a workplace scenario problem. Um, it has to be a problem for which there is no easy solution. Uh, and so just understand that, pr that part of it I think is really important in that they begin to understand that, that what a job is, is you go to work and you solve problems all day. Um, that's what people are paid money to do. Um, and to understand the kinds of problems people in that field engage in and, and the kinds of solutions that they find, how they communicate them, how they uh, support a solution. Um, I actually include in that that they have to have to uh, identify another discipline they can collaborate with. Mm -hmm. So if they're in the health field and they're trying to uh, address patient anxiety, then they may, as part of that project, they would have to research how dance therapy or art therapy or pet therapy could be incorporated along with, say, medication or some other alternative. Um, it's a multi-layered, complicated machine, and I do a lot of teaching in the first half of the semester so they can learn how to do the pieces individually. And in this, uh, you know, it, it's to simulate what hopefully will be the interesting part of the work they eventually want to do. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to share, Lori? We um, have a course here called Quantitative Literacy. It's um, a different kind of math course. It's not algebra-based, um, but it focuses more on math in your life and uh, how you can use math in your everyday world. And in that uh, class, there's a unit on finance. And I think students enjoy that unit. Um, hopefully, I'm planting some seeds in there. We talk about um, developing a budget how to live by that budget, um, you know, try to encourage them not to live beyond their means because mm -hmm. the decisions they make when they get that first real paycheck you know, can affect the rest of their life. So we talk about the power of compounding interest when they're saving money and how it can be a detriment if they're borrowing money. So um, I think that really helps make a connection to and has shows them how math is not just algebra and X's and Y's but how you do use it in everyday life. Well, Sally, from your industrial perspective mm -hmm. and working with business, I know you have some things you'd like to ask our guests today about their their courses and how that uh, can relate to your area. Well, I had some questions written down, but um, the conversation yeah. has <laughs> has taken uh, a very interesting um, turn for me as far as so you all are actually teaching them life skills. We Absolutely. try, yes. Absolutely. We try. Uh, because I, as, as I'm listening to you all, I'm thinking about my college days, and I remember my life skills being learned at home. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't remember my professors giving me these solid life skills like Tim is doing and like Lori is doing, that this is what you're going to, if not use daily, you're going to use um um, monthly mm -hmm. in your everyday walk in life mm -hmm. and doing definitely the problem solving by me working with industry communication problem solving conflict teamwork mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. teamwork <laughs> you know how do you take the eye out of that and just you know work with your t team come up with a solution math the um, industries they they speak on you know, their employees know how to just use a ruler, mm -hmm. how to read that ruler. 
So uh, these are things that uh, our students here and students all over um, the potential employee that employers are looking for. Mm -hmm. And it's just for me to hear this, see, I can add uh, additional information to my portfolio when I go out and speak with the industry. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we're teaching this. You know, this is what uh, Rockingham Community College is teaching the students that are, um, the instructors are teaching the students in their classes. Uh, I know we spoke about the younger generation uh, because uh, also I mentioned to the industry that there's four generations working in the workplace. Mm -hmm. As you see in D.C., no one's retiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you got four. You, you know, people are working up to 70 and 80s. And then so you got the millennials you got the baby boomers and you got the Generation X. So do you have any um, uh, gener uh, millennials in your, like, 25 and up to 35 in your, your classes? And how do you merge those, uh, the younger generation with this, with that, uh, gen that age group as far as your teaching? You know, do you pair, do you tell the older um, students to help the younger ones if the older ones are catching it, um, catching on quicker or? I think some of that is natural because mm -hmm. most of my students are millennial. Mm -hmm. They're early college, high school, up through maybe 25. Mm -hmm. And when I have older students, particularly the moms, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they, they come in, especially in our labs where we have more hands-on mm -hmm. stuff, and mm -hmm. they're explaining things. They're Believe me, this matters. <laughs> yeah. This will change your yeah. life. And just that advice, just that kind of nurturing right. and answering questions and mm -hmm. that different perspective, mm -hmm. it helps them open their minds just mm -hmm. a little bit. Everything isn't about Instagram. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the younger ones you can, can help with all the technology. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it's almost like that. a trade-off. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I love with the... With the history discussions. Mm -hmm. I always love if I've got some veterans and a oh, few yeah. of our not so-called non-traditional right. students, these older students that experience these events firsthand or, or at least closer and they'll mm -hmm. have a much different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, many people today think Ronald Reagan was one of the best presidents ever. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who lived through his time as president mm -hmm. disagree with that right. conclusion. Right. But today he's been made into something very, very right. different. Right. So we can even look at the process of historical memory and how that changes mm -hmm. over time right. and how that's embodied in different people and different generations. Mm -hmm. So it's just one more tool in the mm -hmm. kit mm -hmm. that we can all take advantage of. of, of and it, I don't think it's necessarily just age right. and skill set because those vary so much, mm -hmm. but perspective. Mm -hmm. And we've already got that no matter the age, you just have to tap into it and draw those students out and get them mm -hmm. to the point where they're willing to share that individual perspective. And I think the humanities and what we do in college transfer does that brilliantly. I think we do that very well. So this is not your mom and daddy's classrooms anymore. No. You're, the, the students are engaged and they're, they're able to... Um, do the teamwork, do the problem solving, do the projects that uh, will help them uh, navigate uh, real life. Those life skills, I, which I think a lot of a lot of the students are not getting the life skill where I felt like I got them in my home, you know, because now the family unit is just different. Mm -hmm. It's just a different family unit. So they do, uh, I think the students do look to us for that structure. Mm -hmm. Even if they sort of want to fight it a little bit, mm -hmm. structure actually really works. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and some students resist that group work. Some mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. um, don't like it because in, in the past maybe mm -hmm. they were in a group and they felt like they did all the work. So it, mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I've had to learn a different way of teaching right and instead of being focused so much on the content mm -hmm. which I still am but right but how to deliver it in a different way mm -hmm. it's also about how do you teach group work because that's yeah. not an easy thing to do mm -hmm. it's, and it's it's all about problem solving you just have to be in it and yeah. help the students rather than come fix it mm -hmm. you know this is part of what you're learning what can yeah. we do to help the situation so 
And I, I think the perception is from the public when mm -hmm. a teacher turns it over to group works, it's the kids doing all the work. You'd be amazed at how much cardio you get <laughs> yeah. running between uh -huh. different groups and here's yeah. this fire that you're putting out and yeah. there's a brand new fire and then somebody literally started a fire. Well, I don't know, that's your class. That's my class, uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, you're, you're, there's a lot of work in there, but you're also oftentimes, especially as I hear the volume level rise, you realize it's the students doing that work as well. Yeah. And that again, that's ultimately where I want to get to the point where you said it, it's not discipline based, mm -hmm. it's learning how to learn. Learning nice. how to learn, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I just have two more questions. Uh, so you all work an eight hour uh, job, is, is teaching <laughs> eight hours? That's so cute. <laughs> 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 is, is, being on staff here for the first few years is definitely different than faculty yeah. because I didn't have to take work home. I left it here. Mm -hmm. I clocked in. I clocked out. And I'm answering emails 11.30 at yeah. night. I can't get this to work. <laughs> okay, well, let's try this. I can't get to work. Okay, I'll screencast with you. <laughs> I mean, you are video conferencing your students. Yeah. 24-7 yeah. almost yeah. because of that's when they can do it because yeah. they have jobs, they have kids. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, not to mention all the prep work for these activities. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. grading and, and everything and the grading. that goes into it. It's probably about a 60 to 70 hour week. And I, I really realize it is. I just <laughs> wanted to put it out there to, to let our public know yeah. teaching. And, and plus you have to, you, you have that passion for it. Even as frustrated as you get, the passion just never dies, and you know that you're in that right field because mm -hmm. you're like, oh. And then you, <laughs> you, you're back off helping or writing that <laughs> lesson plan. And my last question is, um, because I do work with a business and industry, which we have a great business and industry in Rockingham County, uh, are they, um, are your classroom open to um, production managers, uh, CEOs, to just come in and visit your classroom, of course, with notice, uh, just to to come in uh, observe. Sure, sure. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, anybody. I know yeah. it will yeah. be, but yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah that would actually be a really great yeah. PR opportunity yeah. um, because, like Sally said, we are spending a lot of time trying to. Um, address the needs of business yeah. and industry for soft skill development mm -hmm. and so all of you have explained teaching, ways yeah. you're doing that yeah, and so sometimes for those folks in business and industry to actually see something mm -hmm. take place like mm -hmm. a group uh, a teamwork project mm -hmm. you know could really be beneficial for us to help and get our, our message out yeah, mm -hmm. so, well let me ask this question we talked about the classroom we <coughs> talked about your pathway to RCC um, not only do you spend 70 hours a week with your teaching, what else do you do for students outside of the classroom? I know you all are involved with a lot of things, so uh, share with me a little bit about your involvement with students. Well, I'm a co-advisor for the Science Club, and we um, do local annual trips, local fundraisers. We do a Susan G. Komen fundraiser every Halloween where faculty will get voted to dress up for Halloween. Um, we do a lot of try to do fun things. It's not something a club that's professional that you have to pay to join. It's, it's just people getting together to experience science themed things together mm -hmm. and to explain things. And we usually do a trip in May every year, about a three day trip. And uh, a lot of the students have never left the state and we'll go to DC or somewhere like that and they're just awestruck. And oh, that's wow. the greatest thing. That's nice. Now, Mark, I know that you work with the History Club and the Art Club. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about your activities. Uh, History Club is, is where I spend a lot of my time. We do the same kind of thing where we try to plan a, uh, an annual trip. Uh, if we can afford it, uh, do one a semester. And uh, we do a lot of local stuff as well. Um, we're working now trying to map all of the informal grave sites in Rockingham County, and there are lots of them where people just on their own property, they've got family that are there, mm -hmm. and we want to try to get that on, on record and, and try to respect these people. There's also a huge uh, slave uh, grave just down in Wentworth exactly. that we're working on developing a better understanding of that. Uh, my personal favorite project is uh, I inherited it from Todd Drake, our, our former art instructor, and that's the, the annual travel program. 
Uh, this year, we're taking a group of 25 students to New York City for a week wow. and talk about blowing some minds. <laughs> uh, on average, about 50% of the students have never left the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, these are unique programs that most community colleges don't do. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I really love about our CC yeah. is that our foundation, yeah. our administration has been very supportive of defining education broadly, mm -hmm. not just as happening by me standing in front of you talking to you, but as, as an experience, as a life experience, it's gonna make you a, a, a better, a whole person. I love that program. Well, look, I'm so grateful for all of you today. Mm -hmm. This has been probably one of our most enjoyable programs, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important for our community yeah. to understand what you give to our students. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget, it's time to plan for summer and fall session. RCC is accepting applications. We, along with the faculty who've joined me today, are here to help you start local and go far.